Good evening, everyone. My name is Tracy Fitzpatrick, and I'm the director of the Newberger Museum of Art, and I'd like to welcome you all here tonight for the second in our speaker series related to the exhibition, The Friends at 50, Selections from the Collection, which includes the magnificent one and a half baths, exposed brick from 1988 by Judy Pfaff. And Judy just looked at it and she said it looked okay and she liked where we put it, right? Okay. Uh, we have folks here in the audience seated with us in real life and we have another over 100 people watching the live stream this evening. I am so thrilled that Judy is here with us. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our Curator of Education, Diana Pulisi, for organizing our event tonight. And I'd, I'd also like to thank Arts Westchester for their support of our speaker series through their Restart the Arts program. Often cited as a pioneer of installation art and contributor to the pattern and decoration movement, Judy Pfaff has created work that spans disciplines from painting to printmaking and sculpture to installation. Pfaff was born in London in 1946 and received a BFA from Washington University St. Louis and an MFA from Yale University where she studied with Al Held. She has been included in several exhibitions here at the Neuberger, including the first of which in 1979, 10 artists in which Judy just told me they got to do whatever they want in the, in the museum, which sounds fantastic, I think, are organized by our dear Irving Sandler. Judy has exhibited so widely two countless, too much to mention, obviously, all. I'll mention the Whitney Biennials of 1975, 81, and 87, and she, was represent, and she represented the United States at the 1998 Sao Paulo Biennale. In addition to the work here at the Neuberger, her artworker is in many, many collections, including MoMA, the Whitney, the Tate Gallery, Brooklyn Museum of Art, and the Detroit Institute of Arts. She is the recipient of many awards, including the Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Sculpture Center, the MacArthur Foundation Award, and the Guggenheim Fellowship. Please join me in welcoming Judy Pfaff. And the crowd roared. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Um, I taught here in 1973 and 74. The first class was for John Torriano, and it was a continuing ed class, and I had six married women. And at the end, all of them got divorced and moved to New York City. <laughs> so I thought, don't do this again. Um, the second time I was teaching sculpture, and I'm not actually sure of the timing of that, but Irving Sandler, who you should know, was uh, my champion, and as he was for Al Held. And he taught in the art history department, and he developed the first space independent space uh, called Artist Space in New York in 1973. I had just graduated from Yale. I think they kicked me out, but anyway, I got out of there. And um, he asked Al Held to choose an artist, uh, and that's the way it was then. They, they had famous artists um, choose unfamous artists, and I was that. So six years later, they, Irving revisited those years, and, those, and ten, he chose 10 artists for the Neuberger Show here. This was my room, by the way. This is Cleve Gray. These were, I was shown this room, and I was horrified. 
not because of the paintings, but how dark and moody it was. And it was like antithetical to anything I was doing. I am now sort of thinking about people like, do you know who John Batiste is? He just won like major stuff. And his song is called Freedom. And I gave that song to my class last semester, and it's like, that's, I need you to feel like that when you make art. Like, if you do this, it like feels like freedom. So for me, walking into a room like this was like, oh my god, uh, somehow freedom is not the, the word that comes to mind. But anyway, I'm going to go through a lot of pictures. Occasionally, I'll stop and tell you something. But I can also tell you that when I was at Yale, I stopped painting, not because I don't like painting or couldn't even do it. It was because of the way the crits were. You brought your paintings down into this pit at Yale, and all the faculty, and they were all men, would tear these pieces apart, and they would argue with themselves because they were all, one was a figurative painter, Bill Bailey, one was Al Held, not a figurative painter. So they sort of went through, and there were others, of course, but. So I just thought, don't bring things down there, and then they won't have anything to talk about. So I stuck everything in the wall, and so I, I was home free, I thought, anyway. So I'm going to try to begin this thing. That's this room, by the way. And I'm going to say play. Oh, God. Ta-da. Play slideshow. Good. Good. An image. New York City, 1976. That's what New Jersey looked like back then. That's a beach. Art on the beach was down here. This is the West Side Highway. It was a long time ago. That's from my kitchen window, what I looked at. I'm living in Soho at this point. It's 1973. I had 16, 13 dogs. My dog had puppies a million of them. And I was uh, working, I, I, I sanded floors, I worked with contractors, I was a framer for Bart Frameworks. Um, I, had, I was the only person who had a truck, so I also schlepped everything. And I didn't know what to do, but this was my studio. It was about 2,000 square feet for $150 a month. So I was just doing anything. I was living, it's right near Canal Street. Um, so the, the lines of this are routed into the floor. Things are painted. So I was trying to think of like sculpture and kind of, I know it doesn't seem like it, but it, it felt like, like what would the constructivist do? What would the fluxus do? What would the, so it was just stuff and just developing kind of uh, iconography and also just doing things which was against my training. This is a room full of, um, I'm looking at these lights. Is there any way to take all this stuff off for, it's okay. Um, aluminum foil. This used to be Richard Serra's studio. He and I are not friends. Um, and I thought if I made things out of aluminum foil, he would be really upset. Now, he doesn't really care, but anyway, it exercised him from that space. So I made aluminum foil pots and pans, figures, organic things. Again, all of this is a kind of about finding my, a, a, what to make and uh, trying to develop and learn about materials. I also am kind of crazy about color as I go to black and white here. This was, I was teaching at CalArts, which is the Mickey Mouse school. And I was thinking about Steamboat Willie. You know that, you know, like old. So this was my kind of homage to Walt. 
This is a show uh, 1976, I think. There are all these figures, which also came into this space, but every figure was a person, someone I knew, based on someone I knew, like what weight they would be, what posture they would have, what color they would be. The fellow walking into the wall was Richard Archfager, and he is a kind of a real tall Yankee guy, and he was very obtuse. And I said, you know, this one is you, and he said, well, it's actually you dealing with me. <laughs> he was very smart. Anyway, so this room had about, I don't know, 50, 60 or so images. This is this room. So you can imagine. The thing that freaked me out about this room, one was its size, but also the walls don't hit the floor. So there's always this reveal all around. And I don't know if you can see, but there's like a, a, a thing in the corner. It's like a V shape. It was right here that made it look like these walls were falling in. I think that's what it looked like. Anyway, the way I could afford this is I got a, a, a grant for $10,000, and I immediately spent it all on plastics and wood and light bulbs. This was lit by a fellow who I met who was at the Big Apple Circus, and he, had, he did those kind of event spaces and had just done something for Mick Jagger somewhere. But anyway, I brought him in and he helped me do the lighting. So if it looks spotty and a little fractured, that's what we wanted. So it, it was called Reinventing the Wheel, but also there was a thing about fission. When you walked, it, you can't see any of this. It sounds like I'm making everything up, but when you walked in, it, it really ricocheted. You sort of were tumbling around. That's what it looks like in color. This was a little bit later in Houston, Texas, and it was the last time that I did anything which had a figure in it, and I'd had it. And also, I was married when I was 16, and my husband was a physicist, so this actually piece was called Charms, and it had a kind of funny little explosions sort of around. But I, I wasn't gonna do another figure, because when someone you know loses their hand or their head, it just was like upsetting, so I just, that was, I, I couldn't do that anymore. Plus, because I was an Al, Al Hell's kind of uh, devotee, I just did that to make him pissed off too, because he was, even though they were kind of constructivist figures, they were still figures. I went to the Yucatan, because from Houston, Texas, it is a hop, skip, and a jump, and I just fell in love with uh, the materials and the color, and again, I was sort of at rage with the New York art world, which was all gray and black and white and brown and heavy and opaque and in intellectual, and none of that obviously suited me, but I also began showing with Holly Solomon, and she is the, still the only dealer I've ever had who just said, whatever, like, can you do the basement? Can you do the bathroom? Like, she just loved going to artist studios and giving them the ability to do whatever they wanted. Uh, that doesn't exist anymore, by the way. Um, this was at the Hirshhorn. So during these early years, like from about 79-ish to about 84 or so, I was invited to do lots of shows and, and lots of spaces. This was at the Hirshhorn, and um, I was driving my truck with all these parts on the back of it, and half the show blew off during a storm between here and DC, and so I had to make, make it up. It was going to be, I think this was called Kabuki, and I had just seen a Kurosawa movie that night because I was so upset, and I thought, well, I'll do a piece for, you know, kind of some Japanese sort of thing, uh, passage through this space. This was at the Whitney Museum in 70, 81. And 
the earlier pieces were, I think, more about water and f things floating and being transparent. And this was done in the middle of winter. So all of the wood that I had, I was burning. And I just thought, oh my god, smoke has the same shapes as water. And I, I love that. Plus, it kept me warm. Because I had at, at this point, my studio was in Greenpoint. Soho, Tribeca, Greenpoint, Williamsburg, Kingston. So if you follow me, the market will come, you know? So this is also that piece. It was called Dragon, as in like St. George and a Dragon. I was born in England, and my grandmother, who I hardly knew actually, was a seamstress, but she was always talking about St. George and St. Christopher and, I don't know, medieval things. So I thought it was in the Whitney and you walked diagonal through the space and it had a right side and a left side orientation. And I love that it sort of got to be, it, you'll have to take my word for it, kind of more medieval feeling. So with every place I go, there's usually a narrative that I hook onto it, I make it up. So, and it follows my life. Like, I think the figures were because I was trying to figure people out, and I'm not, I, I can, I'm a sucker for, you know, I can be charmed so easily, and I can fall in love so easily. Now, forget about it, I have learned my lesson. Um, but this was, it was called a Rorschach. So when I was cutting all this wood, I realized that because the way plywood is made, it, it has mirror images. You, the thing, so I just tracked the, the grain, and all of a sudden, it's like all looked like Rorschach tests, and it was really moody. So, and this was at the Ringling Museum of Art. This was in Massachusetts. What I learned here is that there are no woodworkers in Amherst. There are like four major colleges. So everybody, I thought I was gonna meet woodcutters. I met um, professors. But making this, these tubes started coming in. I'm not actually sure why. It is a very tiny space. This was actually called boa, as in, I'm being eaten by a boa constrictor, so you kind of like wedged your way through here. But these cones and these shapes caught your breathing. So it was sort of like inhabited, you know, it was just like, and if someone was talking, it echoed. And so I, that was not an idea at all. It just kind of happened. I also brought, you know, four chainsaws, like one this big, one this big, you know, like. And so I, I bought this huge piece of wood. I thought I was gonna cut down a tree. I couldn't do that, so I bought one. It was 20 feet long, 20 inches by 20 inches. And so by the time I finished, it was all in shards and slivers. And also, uh, the fellow who was in the show next to me was a minimalist, and he bought the same piece of wood and just left it on the floor, whole. So it was like, oh God, you know. Anyway, this was in um, uh, Venice, Biennale, 83 maybe, something like that. These tubes became major, and I also bumped into a fellow who had, who fixed organ pipes. So he gave, some of these actually made sounds. And then I was thinking, I'm in Italy, the futurists are there, I got, I'm, I'm gonna have this great time. Okay, uh, no, they forgot to tell, this was a, a Biennale that was really put together really quickly, and the, the fellow who was the curator died like three months before. So you know those Fellini movies? They're documentaries. Like, Italy is crazy. Like, it takes 12 people to put in a light bulb in, a, in the office of the president, whatever. Anyway, the f interesting thing about this was I was left alone. There were no bathrooms. There was no electricity. So I smashed a hole in the side of the, that's, I put that there. 
because there was no light coming in. And my mom again, my grandmother uh, again, she lived through the Second World War. And I think because of the futurists in that time and the kind of, the Eng England was at, doing a war in the Falkland Islands, there was something else. The vaporite, nothing was moving. All of Italy kind of, they do this occasionally. They just, everybody's just drinking and eating. So it was interesting to sort of be immersed, and this is on the Giudecca, so it's not in the Giardini, it's on a, uh, an, an older part of Italy, of Venice, and I just like the idea that these things look like spotlights, and it, it, it was noisy overhead, that's what it felt like to me, like, good, I got this, the noise part of it, it worked here. Uh, that's me. was in Germany. I always stop here and I'm going to tell you a story. You're looking through about 50, 60 feet of space, by the way. That's not tiny. That's probably 20, 30 feet high. Anyway, um, this was a show called Westkunst, meaning Western art from 1935 to 1981, 82, whatever this is. The only women in the show were in the corridor. They had reconstructed uh, Schwitter's Merzbau, Oldenburg's Store Days. Uh, every, Richard Serra redid his uh, uh, lead, thrown lead pieces. Joseph Boyce was stealing my ladder. No women. And I never realized that. Like when the history was written, there were no women. And, and one, I've been very lucky but it just did open my eyes a little bit. I mean, I've stayed away from most politics my whole life, except in conversation, except in my voting in, uh, politics uh, around the table, but not in the art. This was in, uh, uh, in um, the Seymour Knox in Buffalo, and you can't see, but it was called Rock, Paper, Scissors, and I wanted to sort of do this thing where there were different kinds of sensations. What you can't see is around the corner, there's this whole kind of waterfall. It's very close to uh, Niagara Falls. I didn't finish it on time, and so I had to come back to the, you know, the, the curators were out of their mind. What the good news was, is Seymour came in and he heard me and he came and he just said, this, this is an artist's studio. This is what artists should do. This is the way the, and so all the people who were terrified that he would throw me out were like, yeah, she's great. <laughs> uh, thank God for Seymour. But also it's, uh, this room was called the Clifford Still Room. And I don't know if you know that collection. It's incredible. Uh, abstract expressionist, American abstract artist. So, you know, you've got your Pollocks and your Frankenthalers and your Clifford Stills and your, uh, you know, Franz Kleins. And anyway, so this was kind of an, a nod. I know it all looks the same, but you can't see the spaces. So I'm just going to have to tell you that it, it looked, it looked Clifford Still-ish in parts. This was my last show at Holly Solomon. Uh, I think about it as like everything I know, like, and the opening motif was like kind of throwing a stone into a lake, so it had that kind of reverberation. Um, this was a moment when I was doing a piece in Japan. I lived there for about three months. Like, uh, you see, this is, you can't see it, I can see it. That guy up there, he was my assistant. He looked exactly like Lou Reed. So they loved him. I was building this in an old uh, factory that they gave me to build the parts there. The fellow who owned that building couldn't sell it. It was near the fish market near Skiji because of the zoning. And after the three months I was there, the zoning laws changed and he made billions. 
So he thought I, I was his lucky charm. So I was, things, you know, things can help, you know? Anyway, this, this, this piece is also called Rock, Paper, Scissors, but in Japanese, so it's Gu Choti Pa. And it's a, uh, it looked like a giant woodcut, Japanese woodcut. The, the, a lot of motifs are from the architecture. And I think you can see, it's like big ikibana or something. Like, and there are things that say things in Japanese, like, I forget what that says. This is tree, I think. And this is the three that says flat. These were signs from uh, restaurants. But what I found out is everyone in Japan had a name like Kawanishi, which I think is east of river. or that. So their names inadvertently got in, so people could read it, read them, which I, that was so cool. The space is a little bit like the ground floor of the Guggenheim. I came back uh, from Japan and on the way home from the airport, literally, someone picked me up and we, I t asked them to go through Manhattan because I hadn't been there a long time. And I was gonna go to this, there was a, a place called, it's still there, it's Kiehl's, you could get makeup or things, no, face stuff. Anyway, I was buying a present for someone because I forgot to buy it in Japan, so I wanted to stop there. We driving by, and there's this place, it made all the walks for Chinatown. It was a metal spinning place. And they were getting rid of all of the walks that they had, the inventory. I bought everything they had. You're looking at walk pieces here. But it was also like, I just came from Japan. Uh, I got this, you know, this is great. Now, as I'm walking out with all, uh, my truck full of, and these are steel, these are steel walks. Um, the guy said, do you know the man next door? And it's like, I know, I don't know, maybe. I said, what's his name? And he said, Frank Stella. And then I said, okay, did Frank buy any walks? No, good, give me more, <laughs> give me all of it. So um, anyway, so this is my, domestic walk stuff. This, this is, I think, is very American. So I moved to Brooklyn. On the other side of this wall was a Solowit wall drawing of circles. And it just looked like, and I've said this before, you have to forgive me, it looked like we both had the same homework, you know, and uh, we mirrored each other really well. This is the 87 Whitney Biennial. This was my, the end of my career. <laughs> uh, this was so hated, I can't, it's like, what's, what's not to like, I don't know. You had to walk by, I thought you had to run by it, because it was sort of like a, it, it's Brooklyn, it was like, not suburban, but like uh, bodegas and street signs, and this is when gasoline was 99 cents a gallon. This is uh, Jeff Koons' bunny. So the only time people looked at this was through the reflection. And next over here was a big Barbara Kruger that I think said, I shop, therefore I am. So it just looked like, I don't know, it was like a brunt of some strange joke. And also, you have no idea how crazy Jeff Koons is. Some of these objects are filled with whiskey because if the Third World War came and there was radiation, the whiskey would still be okay. Does that sound... Nutty to you? I mean, I was here late night, so I was like, okay, Jeff. This is my studio upstate when I'm reconstructing these pieces. Um, this is one of my moments when it's like, don't use color anymore. I was also working with glass blowers and that whole idea about breath and kind of blowing something transparent uh, so, and you can see, I don't know if you can tell there's glass and, and a lot of these things now. And I decided not to do installations anymore. I've had it. 
and these were harder for me to do than the, the big pieces. This was, this was for um, Gaudí. It was called Barcelona. Milagro. This is to show you that they really have space in them. Uh, we were talking, it's like if you see the piece upstairs and you just hit it head on, it looks extremely flat. I was really trying to get these things into space. By the way, I was obsessed with soccer at the time, so this is sort of reference to soccer, soccer, like those kind of the patterns of soccer costumes and balls and, whoops. This is Ursula and I doing a piece together, Ursula von Riddingsvard, who I hope you know. We shared a studio in uh, Williamsburg for over 20 years. She was upstairs and I was downstairs, which is sort of, should, should have been the other way around. But anyway, we were asked to do, I don't know if you ever, if anyone remembers this place called Exit Art. It was phenomenal space. Um, not, not this, but what they did, and this was a tiny space that they also had, and they used to ask two artists who had a relationship to do a piece together. This was like a ship in a bottle. It really literally filled the whole place. Uh, Jeanette Ingberman and Papo Colo ran that space, and it was an extraordinary, she died. He went back to Puerto Rico. But Ursula and I, this was sort of, this got a lot of, the village voice liked this piece, if I remember correctly, and they, it sort of started um, a lot of uh, Ursula's career, uh, even, it, she had obviously a career, but it sort of buoyed her career. I got so used to having that cedar around, and I was doing work in, uh, at Pilchuck, which is, uh, has all this wood and cedar, and so I brought, and I'm calling Ursula saying, man, I found the land of cedar, like they have cedar shakes and cedar, you know, driftwood, and it horrified her. Ursula only works with this, these units, so, so I thought, well, I actually like them, so I brought all this stuff all the way back home. And this is the first time I think I did a piece that was not wall-based. I think it's called Ebb and Flow. Fluso, Airy Fluso. This was in California, pa uh, Pasadena. It's 120 feet long. It's very rigged. This is at the, used to be called the Elvium. It's now called the Chazen Museum. Uh, on the walls are drawings and prints. Oh, God. Uh, this was in the Denver. I could tell you stories. I won't. This is... Uh, Exit art. This show was called Garden of Sculptural Delights, based on uh, Garden of Earthly Delights by uh, Hieronymus Bosch. So I think you can see that there's a kind of, um, obviously is they're very linear, very wiry, and a, 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 a kind of darkness I don't think anyone could see. There's lots of tar in this stuff too. And uh, it was more viscous than I think the pieces look. This is my studio in Brooklyn. And I began using a lot of fiberglass resin. You can see a lot of the glass pieces on the floor. Brooklyn. Brooklyn. At this point, I moved upstate. I'm teaching at Bard College. This, I, my studio was in a, an old tugboat factory. We're doing drawings. I'm gonna speed up now. I'm putting myself to sleep. So um, this I like because it was the piece that was on the roof of the Denver Art Museum was destroyed. They didn't think it was art, so they threw it away. So I had to make this on the spot. And 
was a, uh, and they, and I took the ceiling out. I think you can't see, I can see it, but I took the whole ceiling out, so I lowered the temperature of this room by about 10 degrees. And if you've ever been in Columbus, Ohio, I used to teach there, it is frozen and it's awful. They have a good football team, but since I'm from Michigan, we had some rivalry there. But So it's a lot of uh, sparkly, transparent, white and blue, very cold. So living in the tugboat factory, I was right next to a river. So a lot of this zeni stuff is really f from living by the river. This was on 57th Street and 5th Avenue in the Fuller Building. Everything was brought up five flights through the back staircase. And I think uh, the fellow's name was Andre Emmerich, who probably represented Cleve Gray. Um, he closed the gallery down about three months later and sold it to Sotheby's. For some reason, I thought that I freaked him out <laughs> enough that, um, anyway, I cut holes in his walls. This was in Brazil. I made two stories, so there's staircases on either side and you walked across. Try doing that in New York City without like code violations eating you up. Next door, outside, no one had, I looked at the plans for all the previous shows of the Biennale and no one had used the glass because it was so distracting. That, that park is called Ibirapuera, which is, um, similar to uh, in its importance in the city as Central Park. So I love that transparency. I love that you could see weddings outside and skateboarders and s kids playing soccer. And so I was thrilled that I got to use that. It was a cul-de-sac. It was like the very end wall of the uh, Nehemiah building. This was at Dartmouth. There are people like Madame Blavatsky and Goethe and Rudolf Steiner and people like Hilma of Klimt. And I, when I was a kid, worked at a Steiner uh, college. I was in the field. But those ideas about mm, spirits and shapes and sound and color, uh, the shape of this space was like a fish. It had concave and convex walls, so what, you can't see any of that here. But these were all made in place. They were uh, plaster. This was right after 9-11. I lived in Tribeca, and I was four blocks away from the World Trade Center, and this show was supposed to go up in October, and I was devastated. This is in Savannah, Georgia, and I just thought about reconstruction. So I built a, a dome and took moldings. It was sort of like, you know, rebuilding something. Obviously, it has nothing to do with 9-11, but it was something, the impetus was to reference rebuilding and a renewal of something. This was at the uh, Chazen goes up 60 feet or so. It's a, there's a, a labyrinth on the ground. And what you can't tell, these columns, the steel is, it starts out one size and ends up thinner. And they're held in place by lead balls. So if you, if a child, they were covered so they would be healthy, but the whole structure moves. So I was thinking about sort of the upside down drawing that uh, da, uh, Gaudi did for his structuring of the Sagrada Familia. And I planted, this is in the middle of freezing cold Wisconsin. So I gave them gardens everywhere. This is also a print show continued up on the second floor. The pace had a lot of staircases, so I just thought, give them more. And the, the labyrinth was based off of a Spanish church, I think. This was a drawing show in Japan. Uh, 
the show at, uh, uh, on 57th Street, but down the block. It was six or seven different architectural motifs spliced, in, spliced together. There was post and beam, there was Japanese uh, or Chinese moon gates and uh, pagan plain. So there was, you know, lots of uh, and Islamic grids and it, was in, it took place in five rooms. So when you walked around, it had that. A lot of these motifs are from my house in Kingston, which was an old Victorian. That's a mandala you can see on the wall. So they're details, you know. This is a, a stage set I did at Bard College in a new Frank Gehry building. That's my dog, Willie. At this point, Al Hell just died. My mom just died. Elizabeth Murray was quite sick. And I, I decided just to do this black and white show, obviously they're blue in there too, but that's on the wall is just soot from an oxycetylene tank. That's me carving these things. They're not, they're styrofoam, it's not, those are not plaster. For this show that was in uh, Houston, Texas. Um, sweet water, something lightning. These are the prints I make. I think the few of these slides are gonna be drawings and prints. Willie. He was being good because I had a cookie. These are studio shots. I uh, was teaching in Wyoming and a lot of this work, the color of it and the kind of feel of it, I thought looked not that, but more Western. Anyway, um, jumping this, I went to India and suddenly light bulbs popped up in everything. This is the work that I was saying when I came back from Wyoming. So I think you can see there's kind of a, well, I don't know if you see that, but I thought it sort of had that <laughs> cowboy message. So these are just the way I hang drawings. They're usually on a kind of wallpaper. So this is not so long ago. It was in, in Pennsylvania, this show. Ah, I think this is funny. This is um, with my friend who ran a, a glass blowing place in um, New Jersey. And the space they gave me looked like a brothel, right? It's got flocked red wallpaper and chandeliers, that one. So I just made a very, I think, sexy, as sexy as I get anyway, uh, chandelier for this place and other things, but anyway. And this was also in Pennsylvania at the, the Barnes collection. Uh, I don't have good photographs of it, but um, it was supposed to be a collection, a show of three artists Fred Wilson and Mark Dion referencing the museum's collection. And I had taught at Tyler in 1974 and I knew the collection in its old place. So his wife, Mrs. Barnes, Lauren Barnes, 
was significant. She did all the grounds. She, she had, was a wealthy woman from Brooklyn who made furniture or, under, or a family made furniture. So this was for her garden. It was, it was um, referencing, uh, and the, the title had her name in it, and it was like, Enter Mrs. Barnes, stage three, or I forget the name of it. Anyway, that was the, the, the so if you could see the photographs, it's of the collection of the woods, of her, her plants. This was a show upstate. I was going to, I was invited to do something in England and it was in this place that you really couldn't touch the walls and stuff. So I tried to do a practice. This was a practice show for that. It's quite long, it's 150 feet long. Well, I brought a lot of slides, I'm so sorry. This is my place, so if you wonder, this is, I have a little foundation, so artists come here. That's a cottage where an artist stays, that's my house. That's a drawing studio. Those are Quonset huts that have stuff in them. This is the show I was practicing for, it's a 13th century tithe barn in Tisbury, Wilshire, in Wilshire. Wait till you see this space, it's so cool. That actually, my friend Alon came and he took all these drone shots. I think they look great. Anyway, so this is what I did there. This tree was from this, uh, and it had, this is near Salisbury, Salisbury Cathedral. So all the stone in here is from a quarry, which is right next door. So this, I dug up this tree. I welded all the stuff there. Uh, in this space, there were like holes in the, in the brick where they made scaffolding if they had to go up high. So I put wood back in the scaffolding. I mean, in the, in the architecture. So as you walk through, this is what you saw. By the way, no one saw this show and there was not a peep said about it. And this was like my favorite thing I ever did. Because I'm English, because it was near Stonehenge and this ancient building, this ancient land and with stuffy people in it. Um, I don't know. And the thing in the center, you can't see now, but it's based on the column in Salisbury Cathedral. It had a sort of a big clock with all of these uh, dishes, uh, 12 of them. For I'm gonna run through this now. Ah, my new stuff has all this neon. I'm sort of a junkie for neon light lately. And I thought with Nian, all you had to do is like make, make the, bend the glass. No, 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 it goes on and on. You have to get transformers and have them vacuum, vacuumed and gases added. So this is my studio making this piece, for, which was in the Salisbury Gallery in Hudson, New York. This is the last thing, this is, hold on, four minutes. It is four minutes, I promise you. Spaces intrigue me, light intrigues me. The specificity of a space intrigues me. I don't trust language, I don't trust words. 
just saying sculpture doesn't give a place to anything. So I know that meaning and even descriptions are mutable, changeable. If I say what something is, it's like, that's it. That's the end of the looking. So I don't tell people what to see or what to think, but I think you can read the work pretty easily. I allow myself lots of avenues to take. I start with something and I think, well, that's not so great. And I might do something else and it might look a little better and I might do something else and it might look a little bit. So by the end, it looks looser. It looks loose. It didn't start that way. And I like that. I like that because it might be a month later, I'll think that's what I was thinking. I still listen to students and young people and I'm pretty enamored with them. But for me, my choices are my choices now. I love steel. It's just the most mutable, the most available, the strongest. It feels so ancient to me. It surprises me because most of the stuff I have is actually just soft materials, but it's all structured around steel, all of it. The spaces that I go to before I get there, I'm usually trying to figure out how to make it more personal, more intimate. There are messages that if I'm there long enough, if I'm on a ladder long enough, if I see it from different angles, what I need from it becomes more apparent. The building in Hudson, I've never been in a building like it. I hear it was a carriage house. It's a stubborn, vertical, skinny space with lifts and ropes and work was done in there. And yet it seems warm, there's lots of timber. It's the oddest, coolest building. I'm hoping there'll be a lot of wind that comes through that'll move the light around a lot. Pamela is inviting me into her house. She knows that I really take it as a, a gift that she's giving me to do this. What I would hope is that it will yield a different kind of way of seeing that space. I want it to ricochet and have all these layers. So it will probably be a more complex vision of that space. Divide it differently, see through it. I want it to be a different experience that has surprises and has a kind of, I don't think beauty, but a kind of curiosity in it. We made it. Good. Does anyone have a question or anything?